to me that I would have to all right, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might be, and welcome to day four of the RSN Spring Conferences presented by WPI. I'm your host for today, Francis O'Rourke. Joining me today is Kartha Kanaga Sabapathy. He's going to be presenting his world famous, I would say, Effective First Strategies presentation today. Uh, Karthik, why don't you tell us all a little bit about yourself? Hey, Francis. First of all, thank you for having me. Thanks to WPI and the RoboSports Network for uh, letting me be, be part of the show. Hey. Hi, I'm Karthik. I've been doing FIRST for a long while, and um, I'm a, currently an advisor for Team 1114, a team I've mentored for a long, long time. We're going to be talking about a lot of things that I've learned along the way and how to effectively strategize for the first robotics competition and how to get the most out of your robot and team. Great. I, I'm really looking forward to, it, to hearing it. Uh, this is the first time I've ever been in person or live for your presentation, despite being at most of the championships you've presented at. Uh, so I'm looking forward to, to watching this and being here with you. Um, if you are here in the chat or watching us here on Twitch, thank you for joining us. If you have questions for Karthik, type them into the chat with the command exclamation point Q, then your question. And we'll get to the, what we'll do is we'll take those questions, pull them in, we'll read them. And if we like them, we'll put them on there on air for Karthik to answer. Um, and if we don't like them, we might take them too. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Actually, we've already got one question here. Uh, this comes from uh, user uh, Matt first, and they're asking, will this presentation be archived on YouTube or should I put it up on my own? Uh, I, <laughs> so, I mean, you can take that one, Francis. You okay. guys got this. <laughs> yes, it'll be up on YouTube right? Uh, as uh, probably this, this evening after we're done. So no need to, no need to upload or rip the stuff down. Um, so a, a quick word before we get started, everybody. I just want to... Thank not only Karthik for being here and taking the time out of his day to, to join us for uh, this conference, but also to thank uh, the group that helped that make this possible, WPI. WPI, or Worcester Polytechnic Institute, is a leader in project-based education and was the first university to offer not only a bachelor's, but a master's and a PhD program in robotics engineering. So if you want to learn more about maybe becoming a student at WPI or sponsoring one of the projects WPI is well known for, you can visit WPI.edu for lots more information. So with all that said and out of the way, uh, Karthik, take it away. Thank you, Francis. Uh, thanks to everyone who's in the audience. Let's do this. It's, you know, uh, I was giving this presentation exactly one year ago today at the uh, Detroit Championship. It was kind of um, a good time or maybe that was like a year ago in a day. We lose track, leap years, all that sort of stuff. But welcome. <laughs> Welcome to Effective First Strategies for Design and Competition. This presentation, I've been giving this since way back uh, in 2005. I started doing it on the campus of the University of Waterloo, and it's kind of a spread. It's become a tradition every year at the first championship. The audience keeps getting bigger and bigger. Um, fire marshals are often called in, and there's uh, people <laughs> left at the door. It's kind of, you know, but this, this year, everyone gets to watch it. I'm going to apologize first right away because I know part of this presentation that is so awesome and intense is how interactive it can be with the audience and i don't have an audience in front of me i don't have shankar sitting there for me to make fun of him so i'm gonna have to try to do my best to try and engage you and keep this thing exciting we're going to talk a lot about strategies so let's just like move right in here we go uh hi that's me karthik um i've been doing first for a long long while but um I've been with Team 1114 since 2004. That's the most important part of my journey. Uh, along the way, we've won a bunch of stuff, 51 Blue Banners, World Championship uh, in the Hall of Fame. So good things have happened with us there. Uh, in my day job, I'm a strategic consultant. I work on, with companies on a lot of different things from data analysis to strategic planning, business development. In my former life, I was the global competition manager for uh, Innovation First, where I was um, in charge of designing all the VEX robotics competition games. So every VEX game played from 2008 to uh, 2019 was um, designed by me. And so game design is a passion of mine. And realistically, I learned how to design games effectively by learning how to break down FRC games. And so it's kind of the reverse engineering process. So that's kind of a cool sort of thing. And, and but, real, real quick, just to you yeah. also you skipped over that 2005 uh, Woody Flowers Award finalist uh, finalist win you had there. Um, a, a quick personal story: I was actually as a student there. I was present and saw you win uh, when my team traveled there uh, from, from New Hampshire. And to see you so excited to win that award uh, was the thing that inspired me to nominate my mentor to be that award. And he won it two years later, which was really cool. I thought so. 
I don't know if you knew that story, but anyway, I, 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 did, they, I, I knew you were at that event, Francis, because I can never. I how could I forget that robot with the three? Yes, the th- spears. Yes, the three. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, that, that was actually the first ever Waterloo Regional, um, yep. which is you know, a, an event that's just become so legendary for so many of the crazy things that have happened there over the years, and just the great teams that have played there. But that was the first one. Yeah, I was. Um, I, yeah, I was an undergrad student at the University of Waterloo when that happened. It was a very special moment. Wow. So it's kind of cool that, you know, someone that I work with so closely now on the Robo Sports Network was actually there when that happened. So yep. that's, uh, that's pretty neat. Well, cool. Anyway, sorry. Go ahead and continue. Sorry about that. No. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So this presentation, we're going to talk, we got some different areas we're going to go over. There's kind of an outline so you can kind of see where we're going. Strategic design is where the bulk of the presentation is going to be. And I think that's where the most important lessons are. And, um, we do cover match strategies at some point in this presentation. Will I get to them in time? Probably not. This presentation tends to run a bit, a little bit long, but I had this cool plan this year. It was going to be awesome because this presentation always runs out of time. The whole idea was I was going to present in both Houston and Detroit, and in Houston, I was going to give the first half. In Detroit, I was going to give the second half. It was going to be awesome, but hey, you know, uh, coronavirus happens. So let's dive into the presentation. Um, I start this presentation with some quotes, and this might seem like fluff to a lot of people, but I really think this gets into the heart of what strategic design is about. Not only what strategic design is about is what first is about. If you, you know, we always talk about things about like how first is this microcosm of the world, and it seems trite, but it really, really is. And so these are the quotes that I tend to live by, and I always keep in mind when working on any uh, FRC robot or really any project that I'm involved in. Enthusiasm is one of the most powerful engines of success. When you do a thing, do it with all your might. Put your whole soul into it. Stamp it with your own personality. Be active, be energetic, be enthusiastic and faithful, and you will accomplish your object. Nothing great was ever achieved without enthusiasm. What does that mean? Um, If you want to be good at something, you have to be passionate about it. Not that you want to be good at something, if you want to be great at something. To succeed in this world, it takes so much time. And time's a limited resource. We only have so much of it, and we have to spend it carefully. And it's hard to spend time on something if you don't love it. And if you wonder, because a question I always can get this presentation is like, okay, how are like the top FRC teams so good year after year? They love first. Not that everyone doesn't love this program, but they are absolutely obsessed with it. When we talk about the 12-month season, which is kind of crazy, kind of excessive, it's true for these teams because it doesn't feel like work. It doesn't feel like a grind because they're enjoying what they're doing. And this is important not just in first, but as you're making career choices, as you're trying to figure out what school you want to go to, you want to choose something you love. There's this tendency for us to just chase the dollar bills. And it's like, I'm going to go, I have great marks, so I can probably go wherever I want to go. I'm going to go work for the company that just pays me the most amount of money. And that's one way of doing things. But like, life is too short to spend 40 hours a week doing something you don't love. So it's important to try and follow your passion. And now I know that's a little bit like kind of a basic advice because sure, I follow my passion, but what is my passion? What if my passion is making oatmeal? Well, I mean, that's, that's a thing, but discovering your passions is an important part of this journey. And that's why first is important because as you join a first team, there's so many different facets of that team. You can really figure out what you love, but I really you know, want all the high school students out there to think about exploration, think about what journeys they could take to help themselves find their passions. Because your passion might be something outside of first too. It might not be engineering related. It could be anything, but you got to find it. Uh, the next quote, gentlemen, and we should get the word gentlemen out of that quote because that's so gendered and unnecessary. We are going to relentlessly chase perfection, knowing full well we will not catch it because nothing is perfect. But we are going to relentlessly chase it because in the process we will catch excellence. I'm not remotely interested in just being good. Um, perfectionism is a bit of a trap, but there's a reason perfectionism is important. The goal here isn't to actually be perfect. The goal is to chase perfection because on trying to be perfect, you will catch excellence along the way. And that is so crucial in this process. Like with the first team, you have to set reasonable goals, but just because you're setting reasonable goals doesn't mean that you're not chasing perfection as you were working towards these goals. You have to 
go big and you have to dream big and that's where you'll find excellence along the way chasing perfection in hopes of catching excellence is the real path that you want to take both in first and in life i'm going to skip the next quote because I, i'm just not feeling it today but the last one's very important limits like fears are often just an illusion from the great michael jordan um I don't know if any of you have been watching the new Michael Jordan document, documentary, The Last Dance. It's been uh, airing on ESPN in the States and Netflix internationally. It is such a great insight into the mind of Michael Jordan. And Michael Jordan, there's been no one who truly embodies the idea of chasing perfection to catch excellence because he was such a relentless competitor. He gave everything at all costs. He was, you know, his goal was to win and he was going to do it in the most amazing sorts of ways. And Michael Jordan understood one really important thing. It's about limits. It's important that we set our own limits and it's important that we figure out what we can do and work within our limits within reason. However, don't let others define your own limits because there's this idea, there's who we can be and there's who people want us to be and who people think we'll be. And this is really like pertinent to high school students because I think when you go to high school for four years, you're around the same people. There's almost like, your identity is not necessarily your own identity. It's who others expect you to be. And you just fit into that box. But those are limits. And like our fears, they aren't actually real. You can be whoever you want to be. You can do whatever you want to do. You just have to understand that that limit is not, it doesn't exist. It's being imposed by society. And it's just, it's fictional. It's not there. So we're going to set our own limits in appropriate spots, but we're not going to sell ourselves short. Sorry, I touched my face. I really shouldn't be doing that in this age. Well, just all make right. sure you wash your hands before you go anywhere else. That's all. That, that's true. It's like, oh, I mean, I have nowhere to go. I'm chained, <laughs> I'm chained, I'm chained here right now. Francis is going to let me Dave. I have a hand washing station for the, for the <laughs> seminar. All right. That, those are the quotes. Um, if you're interested in more talk like that, uh, I gave a TED Talk uh, a few years ago. It's available on YouTube. Just search my name, search TEDx. You'll be able to find it. And that's, we really dive deep into those quotes. But um, that TED Talk, which is, you know, kind of like, you know, been watched by a lot of people around the world, was inspired by this Effective First Strategy presentation, which is kind of a cool sort of thing for me to think about. And it's just about how FIRST has impacted my life and impacted the lives of so many others. But it's really neat that the lessons that we learn in FIRST are so important in life and most of the people who've watched that TED Talk know nothing about FIRST, but they're still getting value out of it. And that kind of goes to show how important this program that we're all part of is. Okay, we're here to talk about what you're here to hear, strategic design. What is strategic design? So this is, the concept of strategic design has existed through design processes forever. Naming it strategic design in FIRST, that's something that uh, myself and 1114 did way back in 2004. So what is strategic design? Designing a building a cool robot is a lot of fun. We know that. That's why that's why we're here. We like building robots. However, designing a robot that's cool that does well in competition is more fun. Trust me. And that's part of it. We want to be successful. Being successful is awesome. But it's hard to go through this build process without a concrete. And so this is where goal setting comes in. And I really, really recommend you tune in tomorrow for Mike Corsetto's presentation from uh, Mike from Team 1678 Citrix Circus. They've been to Einstein seven times in a row. It's kind of crazy. But he's going to talk about goal setting. And a lot of that goal setting comes out of strategic design, and it's important to tie those two concepts together. Mike and I have gone back and forth on this a bunch, and it's like it's very, very important. But how do you decide what you want to do? I'm going to go over goal setting like really, really briefly here. The clear choice is success in competition. Like that's what we're here for in the first robotics competition. But there's other choices, you know, uh, but either way, you have to set your goals because that's going to define your strategic design. Um, some goals can be like, I want to have the prettiest robot. I want to have an elegant design. I want to have the coolness factor. These are all valuable things, but it makes most sense for most teams to prioritize success in competition. If, if you are prioritizing success in competition, that's cool, too. It's your team. You do you. Um, just be aware of the cool factor or prioritizing other types of objectives. It can be fun, but sacrificing your own effectiveness of your own robot hurts your partners. And FRC is different than most other competitions out there because 
you're constantly working with other teams. And so you don't you never want to be that team that other teams are just like, oh, we have to be paired with that really beautiful machine that doesn't do anything. You know, so like you don't want to be that. You don't want to be like a, you know, a paperweight. Paperweights can be gorgeous, but you know what I mean. Okay. So strategic design, the process of figuring out what you want your robot to do. How do you move through that process? Well, the first step is analyzing the game. Understanding strategic design. Number one, you need to know what you want to do. So you've set your goal, your final goal, but how do you achieve that goal? You're going to achieve that goal by completing tasks in the game. Which tasks are you going to pick? If my goal is I want to be um, a first pick at the championship. What are you going to design your robot to do? You can't design that robot unless you understand what mechanisms go into place in becoming first pick. So you have to break down the game. And you do this by first examining every possible way to score points, no matter how obscure. Um, I listed some examples. I'm not going to go through the history of every FRC game, but understanding that there's always different ways to score points. Some are very obvious because like this year, put a ball in the high court, put a ball in the low port, spin the color wheel. Like these things are very obvious, but there's more discrete things because for example, this year, one really good way, if you were not a great shooter to increase your score in the autonomous period was to find a way to pass balls to your partner in autonomous. There's no, but we, uh, most robots could do this unless they design this specifically in. And you're not going to design this specifically in unless you figure out this possibility early on in the process when you're working on your strategic design. So that's why it's really important to examine the flow of a game and try and figure out all the ways you could possibly score. Next, you need to examine how to prevent your opponents from scoring points. Because in for the most part, depending on the ranking system, which we're going to talk about next, Scoring points is, is denying your opponent's points is just as valuable as scoring them in terms of games where the win, it's a win loss. So you want to think about how can I block shots? How can I be an obstacle? What can I do? But you need to consider these possibilities. Again, if you go through your season to and your your number one priority is I want to be an offensive robot, I want to do all this stuff. You get to the event and something's not working. Like say you have a can short in one of your motors because like the wires don't terminate at the PCB properly. Like you you gotta flip, you gotta go suddenly play defense. But if you've thought about defense in advance, you've examined ways for defense to be effective, you may have designed in a feature or made an offensive feature that could double as a defensive feature. And if you don't the teams who do those things can adapt much better later on in the season. Understanding the ranking system. Uh, I, this is important to think about historically because um, way back in the day in first, the ranking system was like very weird. Um, on Cheap Delphi recently, someone posted videos of the 2000, the game from 2000. And that one was crazy because during the qualification matches, it didn't actually matter if you won or lost matches. The way the, the, the ranking points worked, they weren't called ranking points, but they basically were, that is, the loser of a match got the amount of points they scored. That was their ranking score. While the winner of the match got triple their opponent's score. So winning one nothing was the same as winning 30 to nothing. It was the same as tying a match 0-0. You got nothing. Wow. In fact, winning 30 to nothing was the same as losing 30 to nothing. You got both sides got zero out of that. So if you didn't understand this ranking system, you would have just kind of been like, well, we just want to score the most points. But it was very important that year to keep matches close and for both sides to be very high scoring. So it really mean, meant that defense wasn't valuable in the qualification rounds. So then we went through an era in first where it was like, hey, win matches. That was the whole goal. And that was like nice and simple. And this portion of the presentation became kind of unimportant for years. But then we had a paradigm shift in 2015. Well, realistically, 2016 is when it kind of came into play. The, the 4RP match, where in a match you could get two ranking points for winning, but there were secondary objectives where you could get bonuses. And understanding those secondary objectives was super, super important to ensuring that your team would rank high. And 
there were some games, uh, 2018 Power Up was a great example, where the fourth ranking point basically required, um, you could come up with ways to like hang collaboratively, but like someone to lift a robot to own that sort of RP. That was super, super hard. So you were kind of saying to yourself, if I'm not going to lift another robot, I'm really making it difficult for myself to seed high. So I'm going to have to be as attractive to an Alliance captain as possible. As possible. This, these things totally shift how you design your robots. Um, and if you don't understand them, your strategic design will lead you astray and you're going to want, get to competition and you're going to wonder, oh shoot, this isn't worth playing out the way I wanted it to play out. So understanding the ranking system, understanding tiebreakers in the ranking system. Um, some years it's auto points that are most valued. Some years it's climb points that are the most valued. But you better be on top of those tiebreakers because those tiebreakers often make the difference between being the eight captain and being the four captain. And trust me, there is a huge freaking difference from being the eight captain and being the four captain. So tiebreakers are important. RPs are important. But you will never, you have to really break them down. And we're going to talk more about some of this stuff later. But it's just really important that you don't bypass this stuff. It's really easy to skip that section of the manual that explains how teams are ranked because you just want to go through the game rules or you want to figure out how many speed controllers you can use, whatever. That stuff's not nearly as important as the ranking system. So pay attention. Um, as you're doing this, as you're going through the game, you're breaking it down, you want to start thinking about possible strategies because these are going to lead you into overall uh, robot designs. So I want to talk about chokehold strategies. Um, I don't know why I keep giving this slide. I guess it's because it's really interesting. But realistically, chokehold strategies are something that don't occur very often in FRC. What is a chokehold strategy? This is another term that um, is used a little bit in economics, but really has become popular within the world of FRC. A strategy, when executed, guarantees victory independent of any action by your opponents. So what this means is, is there one set of actions, action or actions that a robot can do, and if they do this, they win the match no matter what. And most of you right now are saying, well, that's crazy. That's just not going to be a thing. And you're probably right. But determining if one of these exists should be the first step in game analysis. Let's go backwards here. Let's go back to the opening quotes where I talked about you chase perfection to catch excellence. You chase a chokehold strategy knowing that there's probably not going to be a chokehold strategy that you're going to find. However, by trying to find a chokehold strategy, you may find the more optimal strategies. This is really important. So um, why are chokehold strategies so hard to find? Because first, is the games are designed by really smart people. There was a great presentation by Jamie Luce yesterday. She talked about the game design committee. You've got this committee of people who've been doing first for a long time. They love strategy. They've watched more matches than anyone because all of them every week are at an event. They don't take weeks off. And they understand how these games are played. And they're designing games to try and avoid a chokehold strategy being present. Um, if one exists, it's going to be very difficult to perform. Obviously, if, it's, if it was easy, then everyone would be doing it. And the game would be completely broken. And it wouldn't be a real chokehold. Um, in 2002, and I, I should have queued up the video here, but I didn't. But get over it. Team 71... Um, the, the way the game worked was there was three goals. And each goal, if you had them in a certain zone of the field at the end of the match, the goals were on wheels, by the way, and they weighed 180 pounds each. You got 10 points for each goal. So you could get 30 points. Balls were worth one point for every ball you had in the goal as long as the goal was in a certain zone. If, so the goal wasn't in the zone, the balls weren't worth any points. So like if I grabbed three of these goals and took them to my zone, my opponents could not get any ball points. They also couldn't get any goal points because I have all three goals. So that's 30 points guaranteed for me. How else could my opponents score points? Well, you got 10 points that was for every robot that was in your end zone at the end of the match, which was like on the opposite side of the field of where 71 was trying to take the goals. So on the opposing alliance, I can take two of my robots to get to the end zone. It's 30-20. Oh, so I've definitely lost. But 
back then first was very different than it is now. You were could also like kidnap robots. And like if you were able to like drag your opponent into your zone, that was like legal. I know it sounds a little bit weird. <laughs> but you could so then you could get three robots. You couldn't get four because the robot with the goals is already in the zone. So then it would be a 30 30 tie. What was the tiebreaker that year? The tiebreaker was number of goals. So if a robot could get all three 180 pound goals into their zone and no one could move them out, they would win every single match. And real quick, Karth, I just let you know, I did manage to put the match up on the screen for people watching. Oh, sweet. This is let a, me take a look. Einstein final match number one with uh, 71 crawling across the field. Beautiful, beautiful. And so like you can see like the immense difficulty of this task. And the, the robot started upright, fell down, had these giant six foot arms that caught the goals. And once the robot got to the goal, it could only move at about an inch and a half per second. Yep. That was a trade-off they made. We're going to be talking about trade-offs later on in this presentation. But that was a trade-off they made to achieve their chokehold strategy. So like, and they couldn't let go of those goals, which led to a very hilarious situation at one point where they grabbed onto their <laughs> opponent, the hot team, and then just dragged the hot team around for the whole match. And the hot <laughs> team couldn't do anything about it. But... um. Chokeholds are really, really hard to do. But as you look for chokeholds, you find out other interesting things. So how do you find a chokehold strategy? Well, it, it's actually a mathematical exercise. So, um, for those of you who don't know, my background is in pure mathematics. Um, I'm a mathematician by heart. Uh, math is like my hobby. And it's numerical analysis. So you go through the scoring for the game, and you look for the high-value tasks, and you try and... You set things up like as, as balances. You know, like, so you have a chart and you say, okay, if I accomplish task A, what can the other alliance establish? And like what can what can they achieve? And after I've done task A and nothing else to see if they can get more points. So you're you're really playing with this algebraic equation to try and figure out the most possible points you can score and what that leaves. And where this becomes important is real in games where the game objects are not being recycled. And so if there's a finite amount of game objects and both teams are sharing them, then it's this is where chokeholds can actually happen. Because it's like, oh, if there's only 20 balls in the game and I control 11 of them, then I'm guaranteed to have more ball points. And then you have to see how many other point, end game points and whatever there are. However, first is caught on to this. Most games do now have infinite type scoring where the balls are recycled, so you can't just control all of them. And so it's like, you know, like the scale was going to go back and forth infinitely. There wasn't going to be a chokehold point on the scale. And this year with the balls, it's the same sort of thing. But as you started thinking about trying to control the amount of balls, that's where people got into the idea of, oh, wait, if I score a lot of balls, flood the player station, which can only store so many balls, I can create these big cycles where I become more powerful as the match goes on. And that's the kind of those strategies that you discover while looking for a chokehold. So it's hey, important like that. Karthik, real, real quick. So I know that you, you sort of touched on this. Do you think that 2015 had a chokehold strategy with respect to getting the cans in autonomous mode? Or is that sort of subtly different than what this kind of is? No, I, I think it's, it's very similar, actually, Francis. And I think it, that was pretty close because... Once you had, um, so there's four cans on the step. And if you were to grab, if your alliance gets all four cans, you have a 7-3 can advantage. Well, you, now we have a finite number of points that the opposing alliance can score because they only have three cans and they only have so many um, totes. So based on that, you could figure out exactly what you needed to do. And, of, and I forget the numbers, but basically... If your opponent had only three cans, I think if you had five stacks and you capped them all, like you were guaranteed the victory at that point. So a lot of matches were ending. So that was like a, similar to a chokehold, but here's why it wasn't a true chokehold. Well, I shouldn't say it wasn't a true chokehold. It would have been a chokehold if one robot could have gotten all four cans before anyone else. Okay. And that's where, the, because, and so that's what the idea was behind um, the harpoons that we worked on in 1114 was to have one robot that could get all four cans faster than anyone else, and then that would be the match. And that robot's only job was to get the cans. Because at that point, once you have the cans, it, they, 
they don't need to do anything else. The two partners can make up enough stacks and whatever. So that's where the chokehold kind of came into play. I thought that um, a few teams went for this. Um, team oh, in the hall, team eight forty two had a four can mm, grabber. Yep. Uh, team 1285 had two tether bots that both went to grab the cans. So those types of robots were the ones that came closest, but the can grabbers were so fast in general that the two can grabber, that anyone who was grabbing two cans was going to be grabbing cans faster than someone who was trying to grab four. So what the game really turned into was let's just get the fastest can grabbers out there and hope we can get four. But no one was able to truly turn it into a chokehold. But yes, that's an example of where one is, and that's the type of analysis. So like, here's the thing. If, you, if the game has finite scoring, where there's a limited amount of game pieces, and especially if the game pieces are shared between the two alliances, so by where you have what we call in game theory a zero-sum game, where if I have something, they don't, that's where chokeholds can really pop up. So that's what you want to be looking for. Okay. It's different now than back in 2002. I mean, a lot of things are different. In yeah. that, like, first of all, some of you are alive, which wasn't a thing in 2002. Oh, no. But the other thing was, is like, the community of sharing wasn't that huge. Nowadays, if there's a chokehold strategy, it's going to be on Chief Delphi, like, within 15 minutes. Like, there's always, like, people who think they found chokeholds who post on Chief Delphi. So, like, it would get, it would be out there at some point. So, it's still going to be important because most teams aren't going to be able to pull off that chokehold, but someone might. And there's other crazy ones. I mean, like 1678 had a cheesecake bot. They never deployed in 2016. That would climb the goal, climb the tower, and then block the goals, but managed to stay in a legal configuration. Sounds absolutely absurd. Uh, yeah, wow. <laughs> but uh, a team like 1678, like someone ask Mike Corsetto about this on, t on tomorrow during his presentation. Someone uh, please ask him about this because oh, I, yeah. I, I want to hear the story. <laughs> but um, you know, if you could pull something like that off, it's 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 there for you. And I I can't think of any example right now. But like 1114s had some crazy crazy concepts that we haven't gone with. Um, but like in in 2010 we. I, I want to say we, but I was not a part of this because I thought it was absolutely stupid. <laughs> but they had the idea, we had talked about a 469 style robot, but the whole idea was instead of letting the balls run down a funnel, we didn't come up with that side of it. It was to go hang at the beginning of the match and then as the balls are coming off the the rail to kick them in, in midair into the goal. And oh, I was just man. like, how are we going to possibly do that? And like, we a whole weekend of our season was wasted on experimenting with that. And by experimenting, I just mean like people bouncing balls off of people's heads. <laughs> uh, in chat, one of the 11, 14 mentors, the harpoons seemed like a bad idea at first too. They seemed like a bad idea at the end as well, but you know, we'll get to, I can, I, I can tell the story about the harpoons later on. Let's, let's try and get through some of this. Stuff. All right. Let's, sounds we'll good. Come back to the harpoons. All right, so to our next slide, cost-benefit analysis. So remember, chokehold strategies, trying to find one single finite task that overwhelms all other ways of possibly scoring. If you find a chokehold strategy, that's not enough because you have to figure out if it, is it worth it to execute. And you might say, well, if it guarantees you that you're going to win every match, of course it's worth it. But that's not all that's involved in cost-benefit because it's not about the strategy, it's about what your implementation is going to look like, and if you are able to execute it at the highest level. Because there were other teams like 469 in, in 2010 who could funnel balls from um, the ball shoot. There were other teams in 2002 who could grab three goals. But the ones who couldn't do it absolutely at an awesome level weren't that good. And you know, this is where this stuff comes into play. So what is cost-benefit analysis? This is like the principle of economics, and this is the principle of how we should be running our lives. For every task you wish to complete, you want to compare the difficulty of accomplishing it to the reward for doing so. So if you think back to the 20, I, I need to update these examples when people were like actually around 2012. Some of you were like eight. That's just uh. so not, not relevant. Yeah, I know, Francis, we are. Well, no, we're not old. Everybody else just young. That's all. Uh, yeah, let's go with that. Let's go with that. Um, but yes, um, you want to find the tasks 
it's like you want to maximize your numerator and minimize your denominator. That's the, the ratio you want to get so you get the most value of a task. The best tasks to perform are those which are relatively easy but get big points. Um, in 2014, this is an example that works out really well because you had, you know, you could do a, a, full, a full cycle with, um, you know, a triple assist a cycle and score in the high goal for 50 points. Watch them. Let's break, break down even more. You could have looked at the 2014 game because the high goal was worth 10 points and the low goal was worth one point. And you would have said, oh, well, high goal scoring is worth 10 times as much as low goal scoring. It's probably not 10 times as hard. Let's be a high goal scoring robot. But when you looked at that, the points didn't exist in a vacuum. They existed within the framework of a full cycle. And a full high goal cycle was worth 50, but a full low goal cycle was worth 41. And so now it's like, well, a low goal cycle is worth 82% of a high goal cycle. It's not that, but like it's way easier to score low than it is to score high. Maybe the low goal is super, super valuable. And guess what? Spoiler alert, it was. And so that's where you start to balance these things. So you have to have a true understanding of what the scoring value is then you have to have a true understanding of what's difficult for your team. We're going to talk a lot more about that in a second when it comes to resource allocation. However, it's important to do this analysis when making your priority list. The best task to perform, remember, relatively easy, yet provide big points. Um, this year, because the shooting was worth twice as much in um, autonomous, and like, as such, there's huge value in prioritizing programming. And so, that, and if you look where autonomous exists in the tiebreaker scale of things, it's like, wow, this is like all super important. Um, remember denying your opponent 10 points is just as good as scoring 10 points. Uh, we talked about that earlier. It's not always, it really depends on what the ranking system looks like and how much defense is rewarded and how you earn extra uh, just in general, defending is often much easier than scoring. The game design committee is smart. Uh, the For a long time in first, it was always way easier to play defense than to play offense, and that wasn't ideal. Um, for the most part, that's not true. But like last year would be a great example. You could have like one of the best scoring teams in the world, and you could just be shut down by a box on wheels that kind of parked in front of your rocket. And you know, it was like, hey, guess what? You're not getting the rocket RP. So that was something that really played out, um, especially the Detroit Championship, where teams were running two, two offense and only one defense. But, and if the rules allowed more defensive robots to be on the other side of the field, we would have seen two defense robots possibly. So yeah, you need to think about these things. But it, it goes back to the first one, game analysis. Like, you really need to understand these rules. Lots of people during the brainstorming session, brainstorming portion of the season, Miss the fact that you could only have one defender back then. And missing something like that is going to, like, you will figure it out at some point. Like, I mean, I guess, okay, not all teams figure it out. There was, <laughs> in 2012, there was a team who didn't realize the cooperation bridge was just, like, for cooperation. They thought they got points for uh -oh. balancing on that. And, like, they just kept balancing the cooperation bridge on their own thinking they were getting points and they were like hey no one's using this bridge this is great and they they had no idea oh no so it's like read the rules don't be that team but all that comes into play cost benefit analysis you have to figure out the difficulty of accomplishing tasks so how do you do that well i'm gonna i, I get to that at some point but when it comes to resource allocation so now we have this list and it's not ordered yet but it's like, we know the different tasks that are in the game. We've looked at all the different tasks. We've kind of assigned relative values to it on like how difficult something is. And now we're like, oh, we, we know like where the value is. So it's like time to come up with a priority list. So what does the priority list look like? I think there's two portions to a priority list. I think you can do two separate lists, but they do need to be merged at some point. One list is going to look at things like speed, power, agility, center of gravity, uh, robot qualities. While the other is looking at specific functionality, um, tasks you want to be able to complete, shoot balls, climb bridges, traverse the 
Uh, in some ways, it's kind of like if you were, you know, the NFL draft is going on right now. And if you're trying to draw up like what the ideal quarterback would look like. Uh, years ago, that priority list wouldn't have had speed very high because the way the NFL was played back then, running quarterbacks weren't valued. But now, like like Lamar Jackson and Patrick Mahomes are the archetype. So things like speed and agility would be way higher on the list than they were when, say, like Peyton Manning and Tom Brady were coming out. And this is what you want to kind of accomplish with your robot. Um, Wait, as as a Patriots fan, I just need to make sure. Are you saying that Tom Brady is not a fast mobile quarterback? Uh, I'm saying he ran his 40 time in about like five, 5.4 seconds. Like, <laughs> uh, faster than you and I could run, Francis. Let's, let's be clear That's here. True. Tom Brady is, but, but uh, an, is an athlete. Uh, a notable fact, slower than Vince Wilfork ran his 40. So, And Vince Wilfork yeah, is almost yeah. you know, 350 pounds. So, <laughs> the, the question I have for you, though, Francis, is that would you be taking these shots at Tom Brady a year ago when he was still a member of the New England Patriots? Oh, absolutely. I, okay, okay. As long as you're equal opportunity here. You know. Yes, I, I love making fun of Tom Brady's speed because I know that everything else is, is just the best. So anyway. Yeah, we, we, we can't hate on Tampa Bay right now, you know? <laughs> yes. Look at that brandy Tampa Bay. I can't get over it. Like, <laughs> He's really moved into like the dad humor era of his life. No longer yes. is he like this glorious playboy. He's just like a dad now who says things like Tampa Bay. Yes. Like, Brock's trying to keep him young. But Brock's <laughs> well, devastated right now with the destruction of the cruise industry. Like, what's yeah. that going to do now? It's like, oh, well, there's no more party cruises. I might as well go back to oh, play football. Because I got to play football again. Yeah, what, he's what, a WWF champion right exactly, now. Exactly. Yeah. Not, not, to, not to belabor this too much, but. Um, oh, shoot. What was it? Oh. Uh, the the joke I've heard recently is that it took Tom Brady about two weeks to turn into Florida man by like <laughs> going into parks when they were closed and walking into random people's homes. But he broke into a dude's house by accident. Yes. <laughs> anyway, I, I, go, I just want to say, but my my friends, that is privilege. I'm just saying mm, that yep. if I walked into someone's house in Florida, we would be doing a very different presentation right now because I wouldn't be here. Yeah, fair enough. All right, let's move on. Yep. Okay, priority list. This year's game. See, this is one I would have an audience and like we'd be talking and be like, hey, like what's, you know, what should be the number one priority? So I ask this question every year and like people get things wrong. But like, what should your number one priority be for this year's game or any other game? The answer is, I, uh, yeah. It's always move. Mm. It's always move. It's always move. I saw someone in chat say climb. That is good effort there. I understand it because climbing points is the climbs were the most points you could get in one single shot. I understood why you said climb, but you are not going to be able to climb this year unless you can move. Why? Because it's not, you know, you have to get to the rendezvous zone. And so like a lot of people say like, well, this is like a, this is like a wasted exercise. Like, why would I even put that there? Of course I'm going to, it's like, yes, you are. But teams make interesting decisions throughout the season. <laughs> and it's not just about moving. Because like at the top of 11-14's priority list, it doesn't just say move. It will say um, traverse the field with um, impunity is something that we'd like to say. Where it just means we can go wherever we want to go. And that's like a very important thing. There was a team that moved in auto, was dead for the whole match, climbed in the Elims at the beginning. I don't think that's a reliable strategy. Right. Yes. I, you know, deep, deep talk. I agree. Yes. We've seen, yeah, we've like, seen. It's just like, sure. If you want to put move lower on your priority list and like, go ahead, just, just ha have fun over there. Right. I, I mean, but, we, we've seen robots that don't have wheels before, like in 2007, 2013, they just kind of climbed the pyramid. 2013, where you, you could know. start attached to the pyramid. Yeah. So like that, that, you know, there, there, there are ways around it. Anyway, let's, I, I don't want to beleaguer this too much, yeah. but. It comes to be week six or week seven or whatever in this build season, and you are overweight, and now you need to get some weight back. And it's like, well, I could pull two motors out of my drivetrain, or I could get rid of my color wheel spinner. Well, uh, here's the thing. Your color wheel spinner better be at the bottom of your priority list, and your drivetrain better be at the top. But if you don't have this list made out up, someone on the team is just going to be like, oh, yeah, 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 the color wheel, 20 points. We, we got to have it. You know, well, we can still move with two two motors, so, like, it's fine. But it's not. Yeah. And this is where your priority list, like, expands a little bit. So it's more than, it's, when we say traverse the field with immunity, then lay it out. What's going to allow you to traverse the field with immunity? 
you may want to spell out, I want to have four Falcons on my drive. I want to have six Falcons on my drive, or I want to have six Neos on my drive. Spell it out right there so this priority list can be your thing. Next, number two, it's almost always going to be... Now, this is where, like, climb could have been next. You could have said, like, I ha absolutely have to climb. For a lot of teams, though, you know, let's ignore the end game, leave end game aside right here. The tendency is to say, okay, well, I want to score balls. But you cannot score balls unless you have balls. For the longest time, I used to probably say, like, oh, intake should be number two. But it's not necessarily intake. Because you can always acquire balls possibly from the human player if the game allows this sort of stuff. But regardless, acquisition of balls and the ability to release them is next. Scoring then comes after that. And again, you may say, well, I'm obviously just not going to acquire and release balls without a way to score them. Sure, these priorities can be tied in, in tandem, and that you know, makes a lot of sense. They're, they're a package deal. However, you want to know which ones you really want to have and which ones are like, okay, if something breaks down, that's fine. This year's game was a little bit strange because um, scoring in the low goal wasn't something that could be done as just an afterthought with your intake. Mm. So like, in most games, if you can acquire balls and release them, you can typically score them low somewhere, like uh, cargo ship or whatever. This year was not really that the same way. So that's why things got a little bit bizarre there. Why? And it was concerning to me for teams because, and we didn't get to play a full season, but like you often get to an event and your shooter just doesn't work. But those teams would always traditionally have the backup of scoring low. And that wasn't a thing this year. So that was like a, an odd sort of challenge. But realistically, you always want to make sure you can move reliably across the field. Um, you always want to make sure that you can acquire and release game pieces somehow, whether that means picking them up off the floor or, or not. And you definitely need to be able to score them. But there's another piece that ties in there. And uh, from now on, I'm going to call it out explicitly on every single priority list ever. And I think teams missed it this year and teams have missed it in other years. Because like, if you look at last year, your intake was, for the most part, what teams were actually scoring with. You'd grab a piece of cargo and then you'd spit the cargo out using your intake. But in some games, there's the transition. And that it's got to be acquire game pieces, move game pieces to whatever your scoring device is, and then score them. And if you could skip step two, because step two doesn't exist because it's one of the same, that's a huge bonus. But if you don't spend time thinking about how you're getting balls from your acquisition point to your release point, you have a massive problem. And that was so so true this year because i saw lots of teams who had great shooters i mean it was not you know look you just have to go to west coast products site to find a great shooter <laughs> that, i didn't even mean for that pun I didn't, that didn't even mean to do that adam you take five dollars out of your daughter's trust fund and pass it my way please for the advertisement <laughs> right there but seriously and you could have just watched um, the the Capital City RI3D to see what a concept for a great shooter. But the key was getting the balls to the shooter. And how many robots this year would intake five balls and then the balls, they just jam. Or they they drive to the spot to shoot and then they have to wait 15 seconds for the balls to come out and come out in that nice stream. Karthik, why are you talking about my robot? <laughs> oh, sorry, everyone's going to be like, oh man, Kartik's totally subtweeting us right now. Look at that shade he's throwing. I'm talking about everyone. Did you see 1114? Like, <laughs> Fair enough, yes. The, the balls weren't flowing through beautifully for, for even the best TI. I saw 118 jam at points. Like the robots that we've said like, were the best of the season, like 118 and 148. They, everyone had these problems at some point because this was a really hard challenge. And if you didn't prioritize it, you were going to have a bad time. And because like this has to get on your priority list and be high, so you throw motors at the problem. Like, you only have 16 PDP slots. Hopefully we have more in the future. Rev, Greg, do you hear me? More PDP slots, please. But, it, so you have a limited amount of motors you can use. And you've got to prioritize those motors to where it's important. And the, the indexing portion of your robot was super, super critical. So, 
this is why priority lists are important. If your priority list does not get things in the right order, you're going to spend time or allocate weight or allocate motors or allocate money, allocate BOM costs to places where it shouldn't go. I'm not going to start on the BOM, but like Francis got enough 4 a.m. messages from me being like, I hate the BOM. <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh but yeah like it's these are actual constraints that you have to deal with and the only way you can figure out how to allocate things within these constraints is by having a priority list that is based on proper strategic design clip that done okay. yeah <laughs> caltrain get on it <laughs> okay He's like the clip master. Like he'll be like in Libby stream. It's like have these clips like pop. Uh, okay. <laughs> I actually I actually Priority have a button list. I can just push to do it too. So. Oh really? Yeah, because I'm I'm the streamer. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty crazy. So. Oh anyway, wow. Go ahead. Fancy. Okay. Um. So now we figured out a priority list. We're figuring out how to make them. Let's talk about the golden rules. If you're only going to remember one thing from this presentation, um, it should actually probably be the quotes at the beginning because those are like life changing. But this is like life advice as well. This is not just robot advice, but let's talk about it within robots. Let's frame it for everything. Golden rule number one, always build within your team's limits. This is usually where some jack rear um, is like, hey, Karthik, you told us at the beginning that limits don't exist. I'm like, yeah, I, I said some limits do, man. Can, can we like work with me here? <laughs> We have defined limits, and there's limits defined by others. Someone who doesn't know your team shouldn't be telling you what to do. You have to figure out what your own limits are, and you do that by evaluating your abilities and resources both honestly and realistically. Limits are defined by people, power, budget, and experience. What does this mean? Okay, so in FRC, a team has only so much that they that is unfortunately partially defined by our budget. And you may say, well, isn't that limit just uh, $5,000? Because that's what the BOM limit is. <laughs> if you believe <laughs> that, oh boy, I've got all sorts of property to sell you. Uh, <laughs> I actually don't have any property because Toronto is really expensive. Um, experience. Experience means this year on the team, do we have? are we all seniors? Or is like, did that great crop of seniors all graduate last year? And it's a bunch of freshmen and sophomores who don't know as much. Um, how many people do we have on the team that know Onshape or no SolidWorks? Um, how many mentors do we have this year who are working with us? Um, in terms of people power, like it's it's how many people do we have? Like building a first robot, this is this is not you know like a small little project. You need like so many people to like get on lathes, machine parts. Otherwise, you're gonna have these huge bottlenecks and you won't have time to get stuff done. Uh, you want to talk about. I, I didn't include this here, but like, what equipment do you have? Do you have a working CNC machine? Are you, do you have a 3D printer? Like, these are going to define what you can actually build. But this takes some real honest assessment. Things like, do I have a CNC machine? Do I have a 3D printer? Those are easy to figure out. Do I have someone who completely understands how to run the CNC machine? Do I have someone who can handle the CNC machine if it breaks down? Experience is a hard one to evaluate and, and skill. Like, it, you know, uh, sometimes teams have to take a step back because they have this one rock star mentor who's been designing the robot for the last couple of years and they've moved on. They got a few jobs somewhere else. And you might have to say, yo, yo, that dude is not here anymore. And without her, like, we're, we have to dial things back. She was the rock star of this team and she is gone. And so you have to keep that in mind. So you always have to build within your team's limits. And it's understanding where these limits lay are the key to your season. Not everyone, like, it, you know, last year, 1678 comes out and they show this video. And it's like, yo, they're lifting two robots. And so many teams are like, okay, we, we have to lift two robots. We, we have to lift two robots. That's the only way we're going to win. How are we going to beat 1678? I, I hate to tell you this. But anyone who was trying to copy 1678 was going to lose the 1678 automatically. Like it's just like you're just you're just you're just done because they they have this set of resources where these things work for them, but not everyone can do that. And this is like this is crazy. This is hard to think about because you don't want to go into. Your, it, it feels weird to be like we can't 
build that. We aren't 1678. We aren't 254. But the teams who could actually say that and understand that that's true are the teams who have the best shot of beating 254 in 1678. And guess what? Those teams lose matches sometimes, except in 2018. But, re- you know, they, these teams can be beaten, but you beat them by being 100% at what you can do and hope you catch them on a day where they're 90% of what they can do and hope that that's enough to beat that gap. If you try and be this, a team that has more resources than you, you will end up being a 70% copy and then you're going to be behind right away. So you have to build the robot that you can make the best of within your own limits. So you're the ones who define these limits. So you don't want to overcomplicate. Simplicity is okay in FRC. There is nothing wrong with it. I know there's people out there. And like, I've been giving this presentation for years and people like just don't listen. But like, and there's some people who say this presentation, this is a trick by powerhouse teams to keep us down, for, to keep us from building complicated <laughs> robots. Okay. I, I, I get that comment, man. I've been accosted by people at championship. I got accosted one time by this mentor saying, my team was on the cusp of taking down 1114 and 2056, but then our students heard your presentation and they just wanted to build a kit bot and you heard us. I'm like, <laughs> okay, man. Like, <laughs> okay, boomer. Like, yeah. <laughs> Sure. Like, I don't even know what to say to you, dude. But like, I just want to say, your students are so much smarter than you. They've surpassed you. You've done your job as a mentor because that's all of our goals. Yeah. <laughs> Fair. You know, the world is crazy, but like, there's nothing wrong with the, building a simple robot. It's okay. And simple can win. World champions last year, Team 973. Francis, could they score high? No. Only, only level one and level two. World champions as the Alliance captain. They picked 1323, the best team of the world. This is a team that has a good amount of resources. So 973 is not a team that just, you know, that's the, the rookie. They've been around before. They've won world championships. They looked at that game and said, we can build a better robot if we don't go to the highest level of the rocket. Sure, we're giving some stuff up, but we can build a better robot because of it. And that robot won the world championship. Well, and that's and that's especially because one of those things is like you would think that like if you could do level two, level three is not that much harder. But they made the tough call that like that 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 little bit extra was what they needed to to make the robot truly great. Yep, and that extra stage of the elevator, those extra pounds. Um, by building a simpler robot, your robot gets done sooner. Mm. That means you have more time for programming. You have more time to break it because guess what? It's not going to work right away. Things are going to go wrong. More times to repair, more times to iterate. Like these are, it is okay to be simple. And I'm going to talk about more examples, but this is going to tie into golden rule number two. And remember this one. If a team has 30 units of robot functions and you have, functions can be rated on a scale of one to 10, it's better to have three things at 10 out of 10 instead of five at six out of 10. The jack of all trades is the master of none. This is important in robots, but this is important in life. High school students, please pay attention right now. You are not Beyonce. (laughs) It's okay to not be Beyonce. You, You have limits. There's only so much you can do. You'll, in, in school sometimes, there is, there is the one girl who is the captain of the soccer team. She's also running her first team. She also uh, volunteers for a charity that is um, uh, building schools in Africa. She is the rock star. She can do everything. That's not everyone, and that's okay. If you try to do everything in high school, you're not going to be able to. And I'm not saying that you have to hardcore specialize because that's not what you should be doing in high school. You should be exploring, trying different things. But you shouldn't try and do too much. You don't have to be in extra, every extracurricular. You've got to leave room for your priority number one flourish. What's your priority number one in high school? Actually, I'm going to say your priority number two. Your priority number one in high school is health, your own health. That's number one. And your priority number two is your grades. Those are what are the most important things for your goal of success in life. And if you want to go to post-secondary, that's what matters. Your extracurricular, no matter what any college admissions person is saying to you, is secondary to what your grades are. So you've got to keep the focus right there. And you can't try and do too much. And you can, So you might have to say, okay, 
maybe I'm only going to do FRC and then I'll do sports in the, the spring semester. But you got to balance it out, you know, or you might want to say it's it's OK to be like, I'm going to dial it back from my FRC team this year. I'm not going to put in as much time. That's OK as well. And if any mentor says, no, that's not OK. That mentor's not working. That mentor has a different priority list than you do. Be cautious of that. Mentors are here to enable your success. And the top of the mentor's priority list, aside from their own personal help, is to be the success of their students. And we can talk about mentor built robots, all that nonsense or whatever, but like sometimes there should be concrete rules, and that should be the priority of the mentor. How does this apply to robots? First games have so many tasks. There's just like a litany of different things you can do. You don't have to do all of them. I used to get really frustrated watching teams try and do everything. And, you know, I'd be like, man, I give this presentation, but why aren't they listening? But I realized it's because our school, it's, like, this isn't a failing of our school system. Our school system has many failings, don't get me wrong. But this is just, like, it's just a difference. When you get a, an English assignment or a history assignment, or like, you know, a math problem set, it's not like, it's like, oh, well, there's 10 questions. I'm going to prioritize these seven questions because I'm passionate about them. And they have like the most marks that assigned with them. And I'm just not going to do the rest. That's not an option. And so like, we, we're in this mindset, like if you, there's a list of tasks, I have to do them all. But in FRC and in the real world, no, there's some, you don't have to necessarily do everything. You, and so in life, you will have more options than you can process. So you have to pick and choose what you should do. Um, this year, a great example was color wheel. Do I really need a mechanism to do that? And when you look at the game strategically, you understand the scarcity of it happening, those 20 points. Well, yes, it's worth 20 points per match, but it's not really worth 20 points because it's like it's not going to necessarily be available in every match. And if I think it's only going to be available in 10% of the matches, that's only like two points. So like maybe it's going to be lower on my priority list, and maybe I could just focus some resources on everything else. But it's super important that you focus on just a few things and get those things right. Because it's not like, you know, I'm going to say, okay, I'm just going to do th three things, but I'm still going to get those three things at six out of 10. Then you'd probably be better off have, having done the five things, but it's about specializing and excelling at those things. Um, an example I like to use is team, 20, team 1503. 20, the 2011 season. Um, their driver, Nick Lawrence, now works as an engineering technician for Andy Mark, part of the Robo Sports Network. They didn't have an intake on their robot that last that year. They could not pick up tubes off the ground. Yeah. People thought it was crazy because there was tubes all over the ground. They had to make full field cycles back and forth to the human player. And guess what? They went to Einstein. And because the robot was just so simple, single-jointed arm, it eliminated the need for a whole entire joint and they were done early. They never missed a single tube in autonomous for the whole season because they could get a simple autonomous mode done. The robot had the reach with a single joint. It was just simpler. Like simple works, especially if you really, really focus on it. When it comes to your drive train, the kit bot is okay. The kit bot is more than okay. The kit bot is like a nine out of 10 drive train as is, especially yeah. now that you can, you can throw on these powerful brushless motors on there. Like this is like huge. Like you don't need to do crazy and custom. Like sure, a custom drivetrain allows you to mount things a little bit easier, but that's basically the only other advantage you're getting. So like stay simple. Use your resources where you need your resources to go. There are just so many examples of teams that have stayed simple and have been really effective. This year, I know they didn't compete. I know they didn't compete best robot in the world is Team 56. And guess what? Their robot is tall. Oh. One of the things people thought this year was for sure that, oh, well, I need to go under the tunnel. I need to go through the trench run. I need to go through the trench run. The robot has to be less than 28 inches. 2056 was just like, eh. We could do a lot more cool stuff like shooting on the run and having this really nice trajectory for more accurate three-point shots if we build tall. That's completely true. They sacrificed some other portion of the game. And I just wish, I just wish this season got to be played out because I really truly believe that this was the year that 2056 was going to win their first championship. And how amazing would it have been 
with a robot that couldn't do everything. And you look at 2056 robots, they often can't do everything. Yeah. But yet they're still one of the five best teams in the world every year. It's the robot is just like this beautiful example of simplicity. They're, they get complex in areas when they focus on the fewer things they're doing to make sure they hit it at the 10 out of 10. But you can do some cool complex things if you're doing fewer things because you can just focus on them that way. So it's really important to think about um, in terms of all that. These are the golden rules and you want to kind of stick to them, want to live by them, but they apply in world as well you can't necessarily do everything if you're decorating your apartment like just pick like you know a couple nice really nice pieces of artwork as opposed to like going out and buying like 30 different things that you found at walmart you know like <laughs> same, yeah. same same thing with your wardrobe just get like one nice pair of jordans as opposed to like three pairs of like kids or something you know like just get like that one nice pair and like that's fresh and people will notice it it applies in so many different ways the golden rules are the golden rules trade-offs what are trade-offs um this is the key to deciding upon a design because now we've identified a priority list so we kind of know the things that we want to do in order we have identified that we don't want to try and do everything because doing everything is too much for the team because I've identified where our resources are and what we do. Well, how do I pick and choose from within them? And the key to deciding upon a design is evaluating trade-offs uh, appropriately. And how you do that is to use your priority list. Um, just make sure when you're making trade-offs that you're consistent and you're, you know, you're going back to uh, your list. I know. Uh, 1114, this is a great example. We uh, ran out of weight uh, going into Humber, and one of the things that was talked about to get the weight back quickly was to pull one motor off the shooter, which is like, man, that would have been drastic. But it, And we had no idea how it was going to work because we hadn't tried it, but it was just like, no, let's try and find some other places to get rid of weight. And uh, We pulled it off some rubber off the sides of intake rollers and got rid of a pressure sensor. Like, you've got to make these right changes. Um, choices engineering is about trade-offs you cannot have everything you want so you've got to um pick efficiently but like some of these these are hard challenges this year the decision between going building a tall robot and a short robot was a really a tough one because there was merit for both you know like a tall robot uh it's easier to store five balls in a tall robot <clears throat> it's easy to maintain a nice linear path of balls within the robot you get a way nicer trajectory of shot uh, at the high goal, especially at the three-pointer. But man, tall robot, you can't just run through the uh, rendezvous zone very easily. Like You got to be super careful about that. Um, the trench, you have to go through the rendezvous zone, but like, what if your opponents are there in the end game? Like you're locked out for the last 30 seconds of the match. You cannot, you don't have full control over where you can go on the field. That's a difficult choice to make. And you're going to have to figure out which one you want to make. For a lot of these, there isn't a right or wrong answer. And that's another thing that we don't learn about in school. In school, we're so used to, there's a right answer or a wrong answer. Welcome to the real world, folks, where there are a million shades of gray. Uh, you, and you may never even know if you made the right decision. Because you'll go to championship, there's going to be... There would have been a lot of great tall robots. There would have been a lot of great short robots. And it, it's hard to tell if you made the right decision, but it's important. It's also important when the season ends to reevaluate these decisions. And these decisions are not reevaluated based on how many blue banners you want. That's a poor metric because you can fluke into all sorts of things, you know? And you want to really look at the goals that you set you're going to learn more about that in Corsetto's presentation. But you've got to learn, did, I control, did our robot help contribute to achieving these specific goals? And did our decisions hinder or enable us towards these goals? It's really important to look back. I like, and this is a hard thing to do. I like to look back at every 1114 robot and be like, okay, what could we have done different? What, and... 
almost every year there's something we could have done different even years where it's like yeah three blue banners went to einstein won a world championship there's still things that would have wanted to do different so you really need to look at those and it's okay at the end of the season to be like yeah that was a poor decision you got to be respectful of all your teammates with how you say it because you know you can't just be crapping on people's heads like that's not cool but the ability to give honest feedback and take constructive criticism is essential for success, anything you're doing. So looking back at trade-offs is really important. Maybe I should add that to the slide at some point. Um, remember these golden rules? Teams who try to do more than they're capable of tend to fail. There is no shame in building a simple robot. I've just said that before. I'll say it again. There's just like, it's okay to build simple and if you do it properly, it will be successful. Um, my favorite robot last year was, and you know, people are going to be like, oh, he's going to say 1323, or he's going to say 254. No, 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 no. 6370 came from um, just outside of Toronto, Mississauga. They were called the plunger bot. Because oh. they literally had a plunger on their robot that was like, run with like this weird scissor lift type thing. The plunger bot looked terrible it was not a pretty robot it had a plunger on the robot how good could it freaking look <laughs> but man did that robot look pretty awesome when it scored 10 panels in a match it was the best it was just like it was a pure panel bot it was just a pure panel bot but they were just so good because it was fast it was efficient they picked one thing and it was awesome they made the elims at all their events and if they just had a little bit of better luck they would have qualified for worlds like they just you know I, I, they got knocked out early at Western and then at, uh, yeah, Provincials. They, yeah, just like just some bad luck, but it was just super, super simple. Like, and I'm going to talk about them a little bit more when we get to OPR. I'm going to actually save this when we get to OPR. But like the plunger was just so simple yet effective. And there was a bunch, like, I don't know, there was some idiot on Chief who's just like, oh, this team put a plunger on a scissor left. It's like, yeah, and they ended up like being really good. <laughs> you know, like it doesn't matter. Like, building simple is okay. Like, there was this one robot in Ontario, it was called the Shove Kit. And it was basically a shovel that picked up cubes. It was like a cross between a shovel and a bucket. And the Shove Kit was like the, one of the best switch bots in the province. <laughs> and they see these teams building like, these complicated robots and like looking down at teams like the Shove Kit or the Plunger Bot. And it's just like, man, if you only understood that the teams that the type of teams that look down on these simple robots, they aren't good teams because the good teams and the great teams are just so impressed with how they've efficiently solved the problem. And that really matters. Uh, Cal just mentioned it in chat. The every bot, I love the every bot. One day I want I want first to work with Lucian Junkin and 118 and to hire the 118 every bot interns. Bring them to first headquarters in November. Give them the game early. Let them design the every bot, and then we're going to put the every bot in the kit of hearts. And I think it's going to change the program forever, and it's going to be awesome. But the every bot is great. No shame in building it. And it's you know if you're building it, and some people say like yeah, and you build it for a couple of years, then you move on, or maybe you don't move on. Maybe just every year a group of kids comes in with the every bot, competes, and is inspired and does well. And I think that's awesome. So it is great, great stuff. And and not to not to to call it you you in this, but I remember your your 2012 Einstein Alliance had a robot that had no capability of scoring any baskets whatsoever, and yet you guys made it all the way to Einstein with them. That's right, Team uh, 4334. Uh, the why, why why am I drawing a blank right here? But yeah, 4318. Yeah, yeah, out in Calgary, and they were like. Yeah, ATA Alberta Tech Alliance. They were just like fantastic. Their robot. Their, their whole strategy was let's be really small mm. and let's just ferry balls across the field. And they could possibly, they could, I think Francis dumped balls in like the one point goal, but that was okay. It. But yeah, they were ferrying balls across the field, but their robot's top priority was to be really small to enable balancing. And they understood at a very early point that triple balancing was the key to the game. They knew they weren't going to build a robot that was going to control that bridge, but by building a small robot at championship, their value was. They were the only robot that 11, 14, and 20, 56 could balance with triple balance with consistent. And they were going to be a triple balancer for someone. And it just it worked out perfectly. And like again, simple robot wins rookie all-star to get themselves two champs at champs. 
hey, guess what? They're on Einstein, and you know, if um, some I uh, can't swear here, but some jerk didn't hack our robots, could have been world champions. Yeah. So, you know, but like nothing wrong with building simple. And <laughs> great from uh, from Nutty Man fifty four um, from Evan and Chat. They built the twenty twenty every bot eight years early, and that's precisely what they did. Um, <laughs> Building small, there's advantages to it. And especially if you're building simple, there's more reason. You don't need to take up the whole footprint necessarily. There's lots of good reasons to build small robots. Um, ways to like maximize within trade-offs. Uh, you want to try and maximize functionality by having simple additions or modifications to mechanisms. Um, scoring from your intake as opposed to intake loading a score. The best examples of that would be like everyone last year. Like so many teams captured onto this where it's like, my intake is going to be my scoring device, as opposed to passing the ball through or handing it off. Um, using your intake devices to help line your robot up. Uh, you know, you can do fancy things with codes and, and camera with code and cameras now to like auto line up your robot. But there's nothing as simple as having a good old positive stop where your intake you just slam into wherever you're scoring and then pop the balls right out. And it's it's simple, it's reliable, and it's really yeah, I love intakes as positive stops. Um, be careful when you do like these dual functionality uh, mechanisms because it's hard to change one part with another. Uh, this year, a great example were teams who use their intake or their shooter even to spin the color wheel. I thought that was just like, that's perfect. Like, saves you a PDP slot. PDP slots are just hard to come by, Greg. Get us some more PDP slots. When making your trade-offs, Remember your initial priorities. Let your strategic priorities dictate your design. We talked about that a lot. Um, other strategic design tips. This analysis is a must. There's a tendency to want to skip this stage and to head straight into design and implementation. But like, but no, like you've got to do this. You've got to, if you just start building, you're going to just end up building a shooter and not having a good intake, or you're going to save all this stuff for the last minute. Like You want to go through that full flow. You want to establish your strategic priorities, figure out where you're allocating weight, figure out uh, everything you want to do. Like, strate you know, As Wayne Gretzky says, I don't go to where the puck is. I'm going to go to where the puck is going to be. Strategic analysis like that. It's like, I'm not, you cannot build a robot unless you know what you want that robot to do. And so, like, don't not just pull out a hacksaws and just start going to work. Got to come up with a plan. Um, be very, very interest realistic when evaluating strategies. We said be realistic when evaluating your own limits, but like, this is where teams, most teams, mess up on strategic design. Um, I always ask this in front of the audience, but like, how many teams, like, what was? A good team's gear scoring average in 2017. In chat, throw me answers. I'm listening. Rishi, stay out of it. <laughs> I, 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 Rishi's one of the best strategists of all first. So like, this stuff. He's a Waterloo math guy. So I'm hearing five. I'm hearing six, four, six. I'm hearing three. Hard eyes. The top teams, like within the top eight, I'm, I, I'm sharing my screen right now. I don't want to pull up the Excel, but like, Three, an average of three was really, really solid. Like teams, the top teams at championship that year were averaging five. Yeah. Five. Averaging, like, sure, there was some, like, 6 10 had an eight year match and whatever, but like, you have to understand where these averages go to lay. Elite teams typically can do eight full field cycles per match in perfect conditions. What does perfect conditions mean? Perfect conditions mean empty field, no one else out there. So, it's, you know, like, this is really uh, hard to capture because people just assume that the top teams are doing so much more. Like, you see 6'10 score eight gears in the match, and you're assuming you do, they're doing that every match, but they're not. So you have to understand, middle peer teams typically are, like, four cycles per match. Um, but, like, that's, like, where they can kind of top out at throughout at, they typically average two to three matches over an entire season. And so, like, that's decent. So you have to understand that you don't need to, like, consider strategies where, like, this is where people went wrong with the color wheel this year, thinking that, like, oh, yeah, like, 49 balls, uh, teams will be doing that, no problem. Like, <laughs> I just cringe 
every year at the beginning of the season to see these discussions on Chief Dow Fine. Like, I just need to not open that website because people are just like, oh, yeah, we could do this. And like one year, I made a list of like all these teams of like what they said they thought their robots could do with one. And then I watched their matches throughout the season. And they were typically scoring 30% of the amount of points that they thought that they would score. I, I was actually going to shame them in my presentation at Championship, but then I realized that was a little bit too mean. Like, there was this one team, and this one guy was, I forget the game, so I don't have the exact numbers. But like when the robot was done, the robot was done, and they'd seen it run, they were saying that, for example, oh yeah, we'll score about 100 points per match. There's that season, and th these numbers aren't real because I'm just like trying to really start the story. They were averaging 10 points a match. They were terrible. Ugh. But like, and that's what the robot work is. But like, people aren't realistic, and it's so hard because like you want to, and like, I, I understand that like you know you want to say these big bold statements because you think that there's a psychological effect, and like people are gonna be like you know um, picking you because of these sorts of things. But if you are unrealistic, you're going to build a robot that's not suited to play the game. All these robots with color wheel spinners this year. It was just like it, 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 it's unnecessary, and it's why it, you have to be realistic. But using these re rules of thumb are really, really important. Um, just getting to a field and walking out cycles, or taking an old robot, if you don't have a field, but like an open room with carpet, tape down where the stuff is, and just drive the cycles without a game piece in your robot, without ever actually just going from point to point to point to point. And you'll often find, oh, wait, I can only do like eight cycles of driving. And this isn't including the time to pick up a game piece and release a game piece. And that's crazy. Great comment from Kevin uh, from 2706. I think it's self-deception as much as anything. Nobody wants to confront the reality that they're not as good as they want to be. That yeah. is completely true. That is a great point, from Kevin. But the people who are able to confront their own limits and know what their own reality is will be better suited to excel in this game. And they may not like the reality of how many cycles they can do, but it may turn out the amount of cycles they can do is actually really good. And this is where it matters. So being realistic is very important because if you aren't, you do weird things with your robot. I remember 2005, this is going way back, um, the goals were of infinite height because each time you stacked something on a goal, like the, that, the new height that you had to go was based on how many objects were scored. So a lot of teams were like, yo, like I think teams are going to be scoring stacks of 15 Tetris, so I've got to be able to score 16 high. And they're building all these extra stages to their elevators that are never, ever used. Yep. I was at events last year where teams built elevators and only scored on the cargo ship because that's all that was needed at that event. And it's like, man, how much better could their robot be? You know, like maybe they could have been like the Jack in the bot of Lobots instead of just being like this mediocre elevator bot. You know, like if you build functionality on your robot and then get to an event, it's just like, okay, we're just not going to use it. That's a good strategic decision once you get to the event, but you, those were wasted resources that could have been doing really cool stuff. Uh, Guinea Week says people love talking about their max score instead of expected score which always made pre-scouting seem like a meme. That's completely true. People, yeah. I think in general, our society has a hard con time with the concept of average and what it means. Uh, I think people have a hard time understanding things like probability and uh, more mathematical literacy is important. And I think we can teach mathematical literacy in realistic situations by, in this program by getting people to be a little bit honest about this stuff. But yeah. we'll talk more about cycles per match um, as we move on. Uh, we got about like 30 minutes left, so I'd hope to get to some of the scouting stuff. We'll see how we're doing. Francis, stop me at some point, because I know I've, I'm seeing more questions coming through, and I do want to make sure we have some time to get to questions. Yeah, totally. And if you have questions for Karthik, make sure to send them in with exclamation point Q, because uh, we're probably not going to be able to get to dozens of them. So make sure we uh, you get them in early. Yeah, and like it's one of those things where... Um, Anyone can read these slides, and there's lots of this. This presentation exists in YouTube in a lot of different places, but like the questions are like interactive. So yeah. I'd like to try and get to some of those for all of y'all. Like we can't be at a champs together, so let's like hang out on Twitch and be together or something. Yeah, you know? yeah. Look at me, I'm like a Twitch streamer now. <laughs> what? Like, favorite, subscribe. 
Yeah, I like favorites of size, you know, you know. I, I, hey, Caltrain, can I join Team Kitty? Can, like, Libby make that happen? <laughs> okay. Other strategic design tips. Remember, you have partners. It's okay to depend on your partners for certain tasks. So, like, that goes into the whole, like, I'm not going to try and do everything in the game because I have partners. But be careful. Don't leave too much in your partner's hands. That can be dangerous. You just got to figure it out. Also, there are independent tasks and dependent tasks. You want to leave. You got, you got to be very careful. 2015, I saw so many teams make the same mistake, and it, it hurt. Because they had the right strategic thinking. Because the strategic thinking was, it's like, yo, I can't do totes and cans. Like, that's just, like, too much. Like, that's just, like, too much stuff. I'm just going to do cans. Except that meant but cans were worth nothing without a tote stack. So that's what we call a dependent task. And if you specialize on a dependent task, you're really, really putting yourself out there. Because that means you are relying on your partners to do something else. And I think what was heartbreaking in 2015 was there were teams who made they understood their limits. They made good strategic decisions, but they didn't understand independent versus dependent tasks. And then that turned them off of, oh, we're never, sim we're never, we're we have to do everything. We have to do everything. You don't have to do everything, but you've got to pick things that are either going to happen a lot. Like if it's dependent, the dependent task is going to be dependent on something that's going to happen a lot, or it's something that um, is going, that you know somewhat, I guess that's the same, one of the same. Color wheel this year, same sort of thing. If you decided to be a color wheel specialist, like bless your heart, but that was not a dependent, that was not an independent task. It was dependent on other things happening. So as such, it loses some value there. So it's okay to specialize, but you want to make sure that you can stand out on your own or like that you're going to be picked by someone. Like, because the color wheel specialist this year, on the flip side, once we got to like week six and week seven, and we had alliances that were consistently putting up the ball, you know, 40, 49 balls to, um, to trigger the stages, all of those color wheel specialists might have become really valuable. Because like, yeah, at that point, uh, my third robot, I might want to grab a team that can do a couple cycles, but they can hit the color wheel for us each time. And those two cycles of color wheel are going to be worth big points. So. There is value in a dependent task if it's going to be valued and if it's going to be happening. But like, these are the sorts of things you need to think about. Um, last year, uh, there was more of a market for cargo specialists than there was for panel specialists because you could score, especially you know, with the null panels, cargo could be scored right away in um, six slots right there. So that made it what well, panels have to be the first thing that happened. You know, well, so most teams, like there was just interesting ways that these things set themselves up. So you've got to be thinking about the flow of the match and when your dependent task, like what has to happen for your dependent task. To but these, this is strategic design for you. And this is what understanding uh, is about. Okay, we're at about 3.30. We're going to go into the scouting segment. I don't want to dwell too much on this, but let's try and blaze through this. I, there's some things that I want to talk about. Um, there was a, a terrible thread on Chief Delphi about um, scouting and RFID tags. Here's my recommendation for that thread: don't open. Okay. That's so, gen generally that's my uh, my my best strategy for Chief Delphi as well. Unless it starts I, with the letters RSN, then open it, like, click all the links, all that fun stuff. I wish we, um, I, I didn't let the domain, is there anything important on chiefdelphi.com expire? That was a really, really good site. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit about advanced scouting because I think people understand. I don't know, not, eh, I don't know what I want to talk about right now. Um, why is scouting important? Because as much as we want, we think we can watch a match and understand how good robots are, it's really hard without data. The eye test is really valuable in FRC, especially when our sample sizes are small, but data really helps. We have subconscious biases. I've seen it, and I should do a study. I should actually do a proper study. 
people are naturally drawn towards fast robots. Mm. People automatically assume faster robots are better robots because they fly across them. I fell into this trap. I, I, don't, I don't want to call a team out, but we, one year at championship, picked this team because they look, we picked them for a lot of reasons, but they just look so smooth going up and down the field. And it's easy to buy into that. But like the numbers didn't bear it out because their gear scoring was like, and uh, scouting is important because data tells the story behind what our eye test tells us. And it's important to scout in multiple ways. Um, we can, the ideal situation is that you would have 12 students that you have up in the stands. They can watch every match, two students per robot. They can collect all sorts of data on this team. And you have data for every match for everything that you're doing. And ideally, they would do that for every match across every event. So by the time you get the championship, you've scouted every match that every team's played. Fortunately, that's probably a little bit unrealistic. As such, we need to have shortcuts. And that's where OPR came from. Um, how can I tell how well a team is performed without watching their matches? We could just look at the average score, and this is something that's done in sports, you know, figure out like how good an offense is, and it it's, it's a really good indicator. Average score is actually a very good indicator of uh, team strength in FRC. It doesn't tell you the whole story, because in FRC, we play in alliances, and the average score is easily biased by your partners. It could be biased up or it could be biased down. So the whole concept of OPR was to try and extract the individual scoring output of a team or their calculated contribution to the match. And you do that by doing linear algebra. Um, I could do a whole seminar on the algebra here. I'm going to not. I'm going to spare you on this one. But basically what um, you're doing with calculated contribution and OPR is for every match, the teams in the match are the variable, and you're basically saying x plus y plus z equals the amount of points that they scored in the match. And you build a giant matrix for every single match. Every single match gets two rows, red alliance, one of the blue alliance, and you solve for the approximate, um, uh, the approximate solution, which is going to minimize. Like if you think about it, like it's basically like a an 80 by 40 matrix. So you're talking, you're in like 40 space. So if you look at you're basically these planes, and I'm saying planes, but like these these hypercubes, and like you're looking at the least amount of distance between all these planes within this like crazy convoluted 40 space. Of um, course. Yeah, and, and you're trying to minimize that distance, and that, that minimal distance is what is known as the OPR for each team, that solution subset that minimizes the distance across all planes. So uh, as such, uh, OPR is really kind of pulling that out. And what's really cool is now, before, you only did OPR against the total score of the match. But now, thanks to like the great API provided by First, and uh, Alex Raid has done some awesome work, we get like detailed match breakdowns for every match. So last year, we could do OPR based on cargo are based on panels. You could do OP right side rocket OPR. You could do left side rocket OPR. You could do all these really cool things to stretch things out. And this is where you saw the beauty of OPR. Because OPR tells you the story the, behind what's going on. And I remember uh, I was at the Western District event. I was helping uh, my, my good friends, Team 4525, on their pick list. And so I generated, actually I got 1D1114 members. To, I only had my cell phone on site to generate um, component OPRs for the event. And then we're looking at it, and I'm trying to explain the value. And someone was like, OK, Carl, this, this data is all wrong. I'm like, what do you mean? It's like, this doesn't mean anything. Well, I'm like, no, like this is how OPR works. Like, well, the plunger bot is like, like sixth on the cargo scoring list, and they never picked up a single piece of cargo. Huh. And I was like, oh. And like at first, it's like, oh, wow, OPR. This, this is broken how did this happen it's like no it makes perfect sense because opr is the calculated contribution it's not necessarily what you directly did but it figures out the value of a team in what points they helped score and what this meant was more cargo was scored in matches with due to the presence of the plunger robot because the plunger robot was scoring so many panels there was more room for cargo to be scored oh okay and that is a beautiful thing. 
that is Rishi. How did you not pick up on this before, dude? Come on, bro. <laughs> but yeah, like that's the beauty of OPR. And sometimes OPR tells you about teams. It tells you things. It extracts this bit of knowledge where it's like, oh, they're enabling things. In um, 2014, if you were just scouting and just scouting who was scoring balls into the, the goals, the aerial assists, you wouldn't capture which teams were making the most assists. But if teams who never finished but actually were passing the ball effectively moved way up on overall OPR that year because of the, they were enabling alliances to score points. And this is the beauty of OPR. These are the stats beneath the stats. And this is why... So when Ian McKenzie and I um, came up with calculated contribution back when we were you know, roommates at the University of Waterloo, at the same time... Um, some of the top analytics folks in the NBA were coming up with a stat called adjusted plus minus. Because for years in the NBA, they teams were individual players were rated based on like how many points they scored a match, how many rebounds they got. But like there was like players like Shane Battier weren't valued. Or like the like Danny Green would be the best example now in the modern NBA, where it's like he wasn't this fabulous scorer, but teams just did better. Actually, Kyle Lowry's the best example. When Kyle Lowry's on the court, teams just do better. And OPR is the same sort of way where a team may not be always scoring or always doing something that's very, very visible, but their presence may make their partners better because they're enhancing them in some way. They're throwing pick like a team that throws effective picks that allows an offensive team to score lots of points is going to be buoyed up by OPR. And this is where it captures things that your scouts might not even be looking for. And so... This is like really cool. Now there's, you know, and Guinea Week just kind of hit on it. Given OPR is often calculated with linear least squares, aren't you concerned about outliers? Absolutely. The danger of OPR is that the sample size we're dealing with of like 12 qualification matches, if you're lucky, or if like you're at like one of those 60 team regional events, seven qualification matches. Ugh. It's like iffy. I found that OPR doesn't typically stabilize until about like nine matches into an event. Um, that would depend on the size of the event. I think it would be a really cool exercise for any of the um, people who've done like first year linear algebra to try and figure out the stabilization point at OPR um, to, with the variables being the number of matches and the number of teams at the event. Uh, so like that whole stretch, like there is clearly a stabilization point. And I think um, using my eye test and just my gut understanding of the numbers, I think it's about nine or 10, but I think someone could run a correlation to see. Basically, you just want to look at, you, you, you take OPR after everyone's played one match, after two matches, and you look at the graph and you try and see when that can be captured within a certain um, epsilon delta. And once you've set that epsilon delta where you're comfortable of what that range is, which I would probably say like to be like 25% of a standard deviation, if once they're tucked in there is when OPR is stabilized and you can see how many matches that that's come through. So that got a little bit more mathy than I expected this to get, but I think that's good talk. And maybe I, I mean, what else am I going to do on quarantine? <laughs> well, <laughs> play around with this. Hey, yeah. someone, you know, hire me. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. OPR in 2019, that was last year. And this is when I was talking about the stuff with the panel OPR and the component OPR and the stuff OPR in 2020. I'm just going to wing this right now. It was pretty good. Um, uh, with all the separable components right now, like I think I, where I thought OPR had the most value this year, even if you're at the event, it was so hard to scout three-pointers. But um, mm. using component OPR on the inner portal was very, very valuable. So like, because if you can't tell who's scoring threes or twos or whatever, OPR is going to separate some of that for you. And as we get more matches, it's it's pretty good. But... Um, I define OPR to be first games that are separable, where teams are doing independent tasks or doing their stuff on their own. Our OPR works a little bit better. When it's a lot of dependent tasks, like a game like Aerial Assist, it's a little bit more muddled. OPR does pull out a lot of the gems, but it needs more matches to pull out the gems. So that's OPR. I don't want to talk about pit scouting. I don't want to talk about uh, <laughs> match scouting, other than the fact that, like, for years and years, I was like, yeah, just use paper scouting. It's simple. But like, you probably want to move to tablets by now. As long as you're not hotspotting and killing the Wi-Fi for all teams at the events, like, 
uh, going to electronic scouting is important. Uh, it just you can do a lot of cool stuff, and it's probably it's definitely better for our environment. Although I've never seen a binder crash. Actually, I have seen a scouting binder crash because Graham Crawley definitely dropped a scouting binder multiple times in bleachers <laughs> at Waterloo. <laughs> Death bleachers, which have been replaced now by bleachers that don't actually kidnap people or phones or. Oh, good. Tea. I remember I was scared of them in 2005, so that's. <laughs> they, they were the worst. Let me, let me tell this one funny story because this was this presentation, but I'm not telling embarrassing stories. But <laughs> I remember I'd been volunteering all day at Waterloo and I was exhausted. And like one of my big traditions at Waterloo was to um, grab bubble tea on campus because they had a like, great bubble tea spot. And so I finally got this bubble tea. It was peach flavored. It had coconut jelly. And I was going to sit in the stands during lunch, talk to the 1114 scouts, and just kind of have like my downtime, no MC. As I'm sitting in the stands, I just put my bubble tea down. I'm so excited to drink it. One of the kids on 1114 gets up and not watching where he's going and kicks my bubble tea under the bleachers. Oh, no. And it was sad. But where the story gets funny, he just looks at me and goes, sucks to suck. And walked away. <laughs> this is your teammate? Yeah, one of the students. <laughs> Seriously, I'm just like, I, I, I can't even believe that just happened. Like, if I kicked someone's bubble tea, I'd be like, I'm so sorry. Yes. I can't believe I ruined your bubble tea, man. Let me buy you. I wouldn't expect like, a student to buy me a new one. Like, that's like excessive. Like, that's like, you know, like, yeah. $5 drink or whatever. But just to be like, oh, sorry, Karthik. And I would have been like, yo, it's okay. Mistake time. I was like, sucks to suck. <laughs> Did he follow it up with a crotch chop immediately afterward or what? Oh, like... seriously. <laughs> you know, like, really, realistically, I'm, what, I'm sitting beside Triple H in the stands. You know? <laughs> it's like, degeneration. What? You know? <laughs> didn't get... uh, I blame Fortnite, but. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> So, okay, um, scouting, yeah, do it. Okay, uh, averages versus maximums. And we talked about this a little bit earlier because chat really keyed on it. Averages and maximums are greatly confused by FRC teams. Understand that your average also includes matches where you don't move because your radio lost power. Averages include matches where you got defended for a minute and 30 seconds. Averages mean the average of everything. You sum everything up and you divide it by the number of matches. Teams often say average when they actually mean our maximum over perfect conditions. Beware of any strategist who uses these terms interchangeably, but be really aware of the strategist who understands the difference of these terms, but still uses them interchangeably. Because they're doing it intentionally. Why are they doing it intentionally? Because they're doing it to mislead you. They're called liars. And there are many of them out there who will be like, oh yeah, yeah, we they know they don't average eight gears. They've got this wicked tablet scouting system. The tablet's right in front of them. <laughs> but, you know, words matter. And beware of people, people who accidentally use the wrong word. That's, you know, that's okay. But people who are intentionally using the wrong word, eh, kind of stay away. Yeah. I like when working with scouting data and, like, as a strategist, <laughs> Here's what I want to hear about a team. I don't just want to hear their average. I want to know what their minimum, um, like especially when we're dealing with like number of balls or number of gears or whatever, or game pieces per match, or like cycles per match. I, I deal in cycles per match so much. It's just like a natural. I want to know what their minimum was. I want to know what their minimum that's greater than zero was because you know I'm willing to throw out a minimum where it's like, okay, like their battery died. But I want to know what their actual minimum is, what their average is, and what their max is. Why do I want those points? Because I want to know when I'm playing an alliance of three teams, what's the worst that can happen? If all three robots go ham on us, what's the worst that can happen? I want to know what's our best case scenario, especially if you're playing an alliance where you're overpowered. And I want to know what's actually on average going to happen. On the other hand, and uh, uh, Sean Lavery with a good point, mean versus median. Median is probably better to deal with than average to kind of figure out that halfway point. Um, or with so few data points, look at everything. Now, let's be careful here. Different people react to numbers in different ways. I am great if you give me a full data set on a team. Other people having 12 numbers right there, it's not ideal. Someone in chat just said plot the whole distribution of scoring depends on the person you're showing the numbers to. Your numbers are only as valuable as you can be communication, your ability to communicate them to your audience. 
sometimes less is more. So be very wary of that. Um, we're at 345. I'm going to, yeah. you know, this is kind of like that thing on Jimmy Kimmel where it's like, okay, and Matt Damon's coming on the show, and then he's just like never there. <laughs> um, <laughs> because I never actually get to the Matt strategies portion, but I do want to go and jump into these questions in chat. So Yeah, sure. Um, so you, you've done this presentation before as well on uh, on in previous years, so I'm sure that there's resources out there if they want to read the slides or see what you had to say uh, more briefly as well. But uh, again, like like Karthik was saying, Karthik, first off, thank you for that for your talk. That was so much fun. I I I, I wish we had two more hours to put you on, not to pin you in your chair for four hours. But uh, <laughs> for now, if you've got questions for us, send them into the chat with exclamation point Q. We're going to get to as many as we can. Uh, but we're ready with our first one here. This one comes from user Person Isle, and they're asking, um, how do you accurately assess when a very binary or hard wired trade off like being tall versus being short? How do you assess when that will add sufficient benefit to a very qualitative or nebulous metric like shooting performance, especially early on in the design process? So um, the, the first thing to do is like, it is nebulous, absolutely. But you've, you've got to make some lists. You've really got to lay it out for yourself so you know uh, where you are. Once you've made those lists and then... If things are feeling too uh, qualitative as opposed to quantitative, you've got to try and quantify something. And that's where prototypes really is really important. Um, I didn't dive much into prototyping here because this is like a strategy presentation. But mm. the way, and I should have touched on this, the way you truly understand the difficulty of accomplishing something is to prototype it to give you a sense of how much easier something becomes. Um, while eleven fourteen this year was making the tall short uh, decision. Uh, a, sh a shooter was prototyped very early, and that shooter was tried at different heights. And it was kind of found that okay, we we get a nicer arc with the tall robot, but like this is still doable from low with a, with a decent arc and with the set points. So that led us a little bit more towards uh, being a short robot. So it's understanding that. Um, going back to the point where I talked about the um, your resources and why experience matters, you. The best teams in first are teams who have played, have a lot of people who've been in first for a long time and know what has worked in past games, what hasn't. Because you can draw parallels from any game to certain games in the past, and you can use that to inform your decisions. Um, I think this year, a lot of decisions on tall versus short were informed by the low bar in 2016. The danger with this is make sure you're making apples to apples comparisons. Oh, yeah. A lot of people were thinking of the low bar in 2016, but that low bar was only about 16 inches off the ground while the trench was 28 inches. That 12 inches, that's a foot. That makes a huge difference when you're designing a robot. So, um, but looking back at past games and drawing off the expertise who were around at those games, looking at past video, looking through, uh, I can't even believe I'm going to say this, but old cheap Delphi threads from past games. <sighs> um, you might find out where people were right. You'll definitely find out where people were wrong. <laughs> All right, great. Uh, we, have, we have another question here. This is from uh, Azatoth, and they're asking, uh, in the age of districts, does it make sense to reevaluate the viability of being a pretty good but not great scoring machine? So I guess the point that Sean's making is that um, because, like, if, for example, if you're in Ontario, top, the 30 best teams qualify for worlds so there is some sort of merit to that but i still think uh, that's so dependent sean because like last year um we had an every bot seed number one at an event and win it because it was an event where there wasn't a lot of powerhouse teams so like they were able to be very effective at that point then they got the district champs and they didn't get picked because they the every bot wasn't going to be able to hit that level of play i don't know i just think that i don't know how you prioritize to be like a mediocre middling kind of scorer i think it's still probably better to specialize but you're you're right in that a lot of specialty robots truly don't become valuable until the championship and that's a that's a weird sort of thing where it's like you need to get yourself out of districts to become really um, valuable. I thought that especially of some um, switch bots. 
or like yeah that's 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 tough because yeah. there's definitely something to be said that what it takes to win a district event isn't necessarily like that every bot wasn't going to win worlds however it was going to win a district event while there's some robots that can't win districts that will do very very well at worlds mm. and hitting that level between is pivoting i don't know like that i think there's something to be said of after you've qualified out of your district looking at your robot and figuring out what's the best way to win worlds mm. for your robot and Winning worlds as an alliance captain or a first pick is very, very different than winning worlds as a second or third pick. And it's completely, completely different worlds. It's different yeah. weight classes, basically. It's it, it's foreign. And so if you're a team, like last year, uh, there were so many teams that were amazing scorers at the championship, teams who could fill rockets who didn't even get picked. And a lot of them were pretty salty because it's just like, that's ridiculous that just like this robot that's just a drivetrain, got picked and i i clearly have a better robot it's like well you do but that's not how the game was incentivized and it's understanding some of that so i know it kind of circled around your question sean and i think the point is is that there it, it all depends on what your goals are and where you're setting your goals and is, is your goal to qualify for championships or is your goal to win champs by qualifying and like i wish i had a better answer there but i should think a little bit more about that one and maybe get on one of these and talk more further Cool. All right. So we a uh, few more questions coming in here. We've got one. This is from uh, Rooster fifty six twenty six fifty five, uh, and they are asking, uh, "What's your opinion on Elo rankings and how they compare to OPR?" Uh, so I, I love Elo rankings. I think that um, Elos are really, you know, it, Elo looking at win loss with score differential is like there's a lot of value to it. Um, I think OPR gives you a better sense of a team's abilities within a match while well, ELO's giving you a better sense of a team's ability to win the match. I think looking at them, a blend is probably good or just keeping an eye on both metrics. I I think when OPR came around, it was the only metric. It was the only thing that was out there. And we kind of got lulled into that sense of, oh, there's this one overarching metric that we should only be looking at. And because that's simpler, it's this one number to process. Realistically, uh stats are like tools and you want to have a lot of tools in your tool chest and you want to use the appropriate ones when and you want to be able to take a look at the various things that are out there this happened in baseball in the um early 2000s where like ops just became the stat and yeah. like ops plus just that you look at that that's the one stat and now it's like war it's like i just want to look at the players war and that's going to tell me everything one stat's not necessarily going to tell you everything opr tells you a lot elo tells you a lot um i like to use a blend of both i do like that ELO uses some data from past seasons, which is valuable at the beginning of the season. I know a lot of people are like very against that because they're like, every team starts over new. It's like, well, that's not actually true. You know, like Tyler Holtzman's still on 2056 this year. Yeah. So like, <laughs> they, some, some things are kind of like, you know, th th there's value in that sort of stuff. So I, I think you need to, uh, the typical boring Canadian answer, take a look at both, evaluate all your options. Well, I, you know, the, to, to give it a more American answer, right? Uh, it, it, it's sometimes OPR seems like the hammer of tools, right? Like it can do a lot of things and it's good and you need to have a hammer sometimes, but sometimes you also need to not see everything as a nail, right? And just like you were saying with your analogy of not to mix more metaphors, even more your, your analogy of tools is very, I think very, very apt, you know, have a lot of tools in your toolbox and use the right one at the right time. And that goes for you team 190. Anyway. Um, for everyone. Yes, everybody. I just, personal thing anyway so uh another question here. this is from uh steph morrison um she asks this kind of goes to what you were discussing a few minutes ago in the build season how do you manage prioritizing fully developing uh end of season capabilities versus what you need to do well do, what you need to do to do well at your first event such as for district points are those separate lists or is it a continuous pass sort of thing i think it's important uh, when you're setting your goals, you lay out your objectives for the different points of the season. And I think it's totally acceptable as you work through your priority list to understand that you're only going to have a subset of items for your first event, especially without a unlimited bag time now, or I don't even know what it's called anymore. But like, you can just work on your robot whenever you need to work on your robot to understand that your robot's going to evolve throughout the season. And knowing that what it's going to take to win your first event is a very limited subset of what it's going to take to win champs. 
So I think it's if you're trying to build your championship robot for your first event, you may end up building a 7 out of 10 championship robot as opposed to a 10 out of 10 robot that can win um, a, a week one district. So it's, it's important to be aware of that and know what priorities you are. What you, the situation you don't want to get into is that it's three days before your event and you're figuring out what we're ditching to mm. get through this event, having that more planned out. And I think we can talk about this tomorrow when we do our um, session on uh, what the first build season without limits looked like, yeah. because I think this is one of the places where some teams were able to draw some real advantages. And I think it's so un it's unfortunate for 80 million reasons that the season got cut short, but really not seeing this full, I call it an experiment, but it's life, but like this full journey without the bad go. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to that, especially here, everybody's plans for what would have happened further on in the season. But um, couple, we're going to do, I think, one more question before we end here. Uh, this one's coming from Nutty Man 54 and uh, they're asking, what's the biggest strategic miss you've had in your years active on a team, such as completely over or underestimating the value or complexity of a task? Um, so 2009, let's see, I still don't understand that game. <laughs> I, so I, I'm still strategically missing on that game. I'm like, what, how it was played? But like, no, uh, not understanding how important the human player was. Mm. The human player was that entire game. The robots were nearly irrelevant. Human players were doing more than 50% of the scoring. Um, if we truly understood that, we would have put more resources into human player training or uh, recruiting something. Um, I think that could that really... Like, uh, we ended up with a great robot at a championship that year that's seeded number one, but like that was a human player sort of game there and then uh 2016 we shouldn't have built a, a little robot to go under that uh, barrier even i was just thinking about it the other day i'm just like why did we build low again like we could have still cleared all the defenses with the taller robot our shot would have been way more accurate we still could have gone everywhere on the field except for one defense but like already we couldn't do like the sally for drawbridge so like if we had just like made our tall robot given it the ability to do that stuff like it's yeah. I get that the low bar was a consistent thing, but like it just it made shooting so much harder that and so that was I think that was a miss. Yeah, I think I think specifically in that, I think a lot of teams probably share that sentiment with 2016. I yeah, mean, and Sean says building low with 2016 was all about the consistent path for autonomous, but like our autonomous pathing is really good. Like I just <laughs> feel like we could have been a tall robot and gone over the rough terrain or the boat. Well some teams do get stuck in the but like, you know, we just, if we went over whatever it was, it would have been fine. Yeah. Like, I think we could have, we could have built around that, I, I believe. And I think that autonomous was not actually that super important in that game, to be completely honest. True. I think we could have given up a bit of auto to make us just a way better shooter and like been like 5172 or 1241. Cool. All right. Well, I think that's, that's all the time we have. Um, I know that we didn't quite get to all your presentation and we didn't quite answer every single question, but I hope everybody watching had a good time. I can tell by a lot of the comments and chat that they're really appreciative of, of your presentation today, Karthik. So I want to thank you for taking the time out of your day to be here with us and talk about some really cool stuff. Yeah. Francis, well, thanks for having me. Thanks yeah. to you. Thanks to yourself. Uh, everyone at the RSN WPI for putting these conferences on. I mean, we, we, we can't be in Houston or Detroit right now, but at least we've got like a slice of it here and that's nice. And it's always great to interact with the community and, uh, all I can say is, hey, tune in Thursday night, First Canada Live. We got our second yeah. award show, and uh, you know we're going to find out who's winning Woody Flowers in Ontario, all our district chairman's award winners, and like it's just going to be a fun time. So watch all the award shows this week, and tune into First Big Show on Saturday, and it's going to be good. Thanks, Francis, and I'll see you all tomorrow. Yeah, and everybody else who's watching now, stay tuned because right after this, we're coming up in just a few minutes with our next presentation of the day. This is going to be by Brad Miller, the leader of the WPI Live Design Team with several of his members are joining him. And he's going to be talking about uh, machine learning in FIRST Robotics. If you didn't know, machine learning exists now in WPI Live. You can do it right now today. Maybe it wasn't good today. Who knows what the future games are going to bring to us. So definitely check that out and learn more about that. So one last thank you to Karthik here. Thank you so much for being here. And everybody will see you in just a few minutes. Thanks, guys. That guy would have to lose.